Ottawa County. Just want to do a little housekeeping before we get started. The bathrooms are out the door and to your left, and feel free at any time during the next couple of hours to get up and, and have some of the breakfast. I want to certainly uh, recognize the Bank of Holland for, uh, for providing the breakfast for us this morning from Anything Goes Catering. Um, my name is Lynn Raymond, and I'm the coordinator of the Lakeshore Housing Alliance. The Lakeshore Housing Alliance was formed in 1998 at the direction of the Department of Housing and Urban Development in order to manage funds for homeless services. Since then, the LHA has grown to encompass more comprehensive housing goals related to housing stability as a whole. The LHA currently facilitates the distribution of more than a million dollars in homeless service funds. For many years, the, um, the LHA was generously hosted by Community Action House. But last year, the uh, LHA Executive Committee felt the need to expand, to seek ways to expand our services and influence in the housing arena. And so as the LHA was becoming, was thinking about becoming a registered nonprofit, we were approached by the Greater Ottawa County United Way who, with an offer to become the host agency. So the LHA is now an integral part of United Way's impact area strategy for financial stability and basic needs. The LHA is made up of 23 agencies, businesses, and individuals, and much of the work of the Lakeshore Housing Alliance is guided by the goals and objectives of the Ottawa County Planned and Homeless Council. The LHA also responds <coughs> to opportunities to educate the community about homelessness and housing. One such opportunity uh, arose last summer, and the LHA facilitated a discussion with community partners about addressing the issue of people living unsheltered in the community. Over time, the focus of the group shifted to a larger countywide issue of affordable housing. Knowing the magnitude of community involvement that would be needed to address affordable housing, the LHA engaged Patrick Sisler, the director of the Lakeshore Nonprofit Association and the Ottawa County Human Services Coordinating Council to help facilitate that conversation. These organizations and individuals were part of what led us to today's meeting. So again, thank you for joining us at this conversation, and I'm going to turn over the next couple hours to Patrick. Thank you. So as Lynn mentioned, I have the privilege of serving as director of the Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance and the Ottawa County Human Services Coordinating Council, which you may know very little, you may know a lot about these organizations, but I do want to share just in brief the work that they are doing together, because I think it will help bring relevance and context to why I am your host here this morning. About six months ago, these two organizations came together in a formal partnership, really to provide a new community resource to look at some of the greatest issues that we are facing in what I would call the social sector and help coordinate a response to, a, a response to address that. So they do it. What, what does that look like? It's a few things. First, it's about identifying those priorities, helping to convene various organizations, groups, and individuals around that social issue, helping them collaborate. And where I think we really provide value is coordinating the effort so we not only spark the conversation, we keep that conversation moving, and arguably the most important thing we do is provide the role of a neutral facilitator, trying to bring a neutral voice to any collaboration. Every collaboration is going to have self-interest involved, and so hopefully we can play that role of neutrality. So as Lynn mentioned, housing was already on our radar. They had, they had formed a planning committee, had already been talking about this, so it seemed like a match made in heaven for us to come alongside and help to scale that conversation. So before I jump into what we're going to talk about today, I have to be honest. Um, I, was I was up last night putting this together, final slides, going over what I'm going to talk about, and I realized I don't want to give this talk. This is a really hard talk to give. People might not like to hear what I'm going to say. And I got a voicemail, and I can't make this up. I got a voicemail from a dear friend who I haven't heard from in months, and who I have tremendous respect for in the community, and, and, and he said, hey Patrick, haven't talked in a while, um, heard you're doing this affordable housing thing, and just wanted to let you know, we have a woman who's been staying with us for a few months, and I want to talk to you about her options. And I thought, 
Well, that couldn't be more perfect timing. So I said, okay, this conversation has to take place at some time. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're all here today to take part in that. So what are we going to cover today? Well, first, I'm going to talk about what is our current reality. And that's really highlighting what is the problem we face around this issue of housing. Then I'll transition into what that means for us as a community. What impact does that have on the larger community, on our businesses, on individuals and families, on the social sector, and how if we do nothing about it, what that means for our future. Then I'm going to transition into what a preferred future could look like, very early stages of that. And up until about 12 hours ago, I was going to share with you what some other communities are doing to address this very issue, which gets to the solutions piece. But we realized, you know what, there is a critical step that is missing, and that's why you're all here today. And so I'm going to get to this question mark in just a second. So what are the goals today? Well, first is to elevate the conversation around housing for all to another level of community stakeholders. This conversation around housing has been taking place for years in groups like the Planning Committee under the Lakeshore Housing Alliance, but it has not reached a level of decision makers like we have represented in this room. And so the first goal is just to elevate that conversation, help more people understand what is going on. The second thing is to take the, the first steps to answering this question, and this gets back to the question mark on the diagram I just showed you. How do we create and implement a cross-sector, regional, and long-term strategy to provide housing for all? We can't even start to talk about solutions because the solutions are messy and they all require a lot of people to give. So before we even creep into solutions, I think we need to start putting the steps together to answering this question. So I'm going to plant that seed now, but I'll circle back towards the end of the presentation. So what is our current reality? What is the problem that we face? And um, this is just going on. what is the problem we face? Before I discuss the problem, I think we need to highlight the fact that Ottawa County is a wonderful place to live. Right? I was born and re raised here. I can vouch for that. I'm sure many, many others in this room can as well. And we've been blessed over the last several years to be recognized for that. We have the healthiest cities. We have the top beaches. We are a retirement destination. Right? We're the healthiest county. We're the most philanthropic county in Michigan, one of the most philanthropic regions in the entire country. We have, we've recently topped nation in, in job growth. This is an incredible place to live. And if you look at some of the community organizations that help make this so, their mission and vision shares exactly that. It's about create. they all in one way or another say, we want to create a place to live, work, and play. We want to create a high quality of life. Now I've highlighted in bold on this anything that says living, life, quality of life, location of life, because when I think about living, I can't help but think, where do I spend most of my time? And I spend most of my time in my home, in my house, if I were to break down my week. So I would argue, if, if we are really concerned about life and living in this community, we have to be concerned about homes and houses. So we know Ottawa County is a wonderful place to live. But it's my hope, it's my fear, actually, that it's no longer a practical place for people to live. So in order to outline the problem, uh, I'm going to go from micro to macro. I'm going to start with very specific examples, and I'm going to keep pulling back to look at, at further countywide data. So let me start by telling you a story. I want you to meet Jim. Jim is your prototypical Holland Rescue Mission client. Shows up at the doorstep, likely has spent some time in prison, probably has a substance abuse issue, maybe has a child, not paying child support. He's burned every job and family relationship that he has, and he is on his last leg. So he comes to the mission, spends a few weeks there, and decides he wants to turn his life around. Joins a long-term program, starts to take some educational classes, maybe he gets his GED, he gets soft skills and hard skills he needs, he gets a mentor and starts learning uh, how to pick up the pieces in his life. Then he gets a job through another nonprofit in our community called 70 Times 7. He starts working, starts paying down debt. Things are going right. But he gets to a point in the program where the natural next step is to move on, move out of the mission, and move back into society. So he starts looking for a place to live. One month goes by, two months go by, more months. Six months later, he's still at the homeless shelter saying, what am I doing? So he does what, the next, what he thinks is the next best thing. He rents a room by the week with six, maybe eight other guys in other rooms in a house in the community. 
Now, some of these guys, granted, might also be coming out of a recovery program like the Mission or another nonprofit, but most of them are fresh out of prison. Maybe they were kicked out of the rescue mission. Maybe they're just looking for an affordable place to live. So you have six to eight guys renting a room in the same house together. Do you think this is the best environment for Jim, who's on the road to recovery, to enter into? Absolutely not. How long does it take for Jim for the wheels to fall off and for Jim to wind up back at the rescue mission store? So you might be thinking, okay, that's you know, single, single male made his, made his, his choice in life, and, and that's, that's where he's at. But this is happening to families, too. So I want you to meet Nick and Polly. Nick and Polly are a young couple with a, a child, married, find themselves at the rescue mission. During their time there, Polly completes her GED, goes from a part-time job to a full-time job. Nick goes from a full-time job to one and a half full-time jobs. So 2.5 jobs between the two of them. And same story. Six months in, <coughs> cannot find a place to live in the community. So what do they do? Well, they don't go into a house like Jim did, but they go to the value place, which is similar to a hotel that you can picture in Holland off 31. You rent a room by the week. And they're there for three months before they burn out all their cash and wind up back at the rescue mission store. These stories are all too common. But you may be saying, OK, there's a you know, couple examples. So let's pull back a little further. Let's look at some, a wider view of rescue mission data. Last year, between 500 and 600 men cycled, so just the men's mission. Five to 600 cycled through the Holland Rescue Mission stores. Of those, from what we can calculate, 10 to 12 moved on to what we would classify as stable, affordable housing of their own. So the, for the, what does that mean for the rest? Maybe they're still there. Maybe they, they moved out. Maybe they repaired some relationships. They moved back with family. They moved back with friends. An awful lot of them move into that weekly, uh, weekly room rental situation. But 10 to 12 moved on to what we would consider to be stable, affordable housing. Of those, six of them only did so through the use of some kind of public assistance. So maybe they received a housing voucher, some kind of uh, public, uh, public subsidy. Okay? Maybe they moved on to a Good Samaritan uh, Ministries program and were able to obtain a house there. And this is the most shocking thing for me. More than half of them were working when they left. It wasn't an issue of obtaining a job but they just had nowhere to go after completing the rescue missions program. Let me pull back a little further. I was able to take part in a planning session that actually took place in this, in this very room called the Ottawa County Housing Forum. This was hosted by the Lakeshore Housing Alliance and the Greater Ottawa County United Way. It took place in this very room. You might recognize it. And 50 organizations came to this. And really the goal of that morning was a, a big, you can see a big whiteboard or a big white sheet was pasted along that wall and all the organizations that did something around the issue of really emergency uh, housing support to shelter support, rental assistance, transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, every one of those organizations put up on that map where they fit in the timeline. And so a couple, there, there are a couple takeaways from this. The first is we have a lot of nonprofit, government, faith-based agencies doing a lot of really good work in this community on the back end. We have a lot. But the big takeaway for me was at the end of the supportive service side, there is a big gap in our community between ending supportive services and truly being financially independent. And this was something that I had heard but couldn't articulate for several months having met with a number of organizations that talked about working with their clients. And the best image that comes to mind for me is this. It's a bridge that's missing the middle. We have, Ottawa County is a great place to live. We all know that. We have the independent financial side. If you can get there, it's an incredible place. And we need to strive to keep it that way. And we have some incredible supportive services. A lot of great nonprofits, government, faith-based organizations doing work on the back end. But we are absolutely missing this middle component. So let me pull back a little further. Okay, now let's look at, at countywide. Uh, every three years, the, uh, uh, the Greater Ottawa County United Way, through an incredible collaboration with other partners in the community, conduct what's called the Community Needs Assessment. And they ask, it's a household survey, they ask, uh, uh, it, well there's data that goes into it, but a major component is a household survey that asks a number of questions. It's not a targeted survey, it goes out to everyone. Okay? Now, it, not everybody responds to this, 
But one of the questions they ask is, how often do you run out of money for shelter for you and your family? And these are the, these are the potential responses. All the time, at least once a month, occasionally, or never. And here are the answers from the last needs assessment. All the time, 40%. At least once a month, closer to 10%. Occasionally, 19%. Never, 31.3%. So the first thing that sticks out is less than a third of the county population, based on the survey, has never had an issue making a housing payment. But the next thing that's really striking is if you add up these two numbers, just about half of Ottawa County struggles with this issue monthly. Okay, so this is a locally conducted survey, still not, you know, maybe this isn't very, you know, completely comprehensive. So let's pull back, let's look at some federal data. But before we do that, I want to pause, and two things I'm going to do throughout the day here, and this is risky. One is I'm going to clarify things. I want to clarify what I'm saying so we're all on the same page. The other thing I'm going to do that's a little more risky is I'm going to challenge some perceptions of ours. But on the clarification piece, I've already started to use the word affordable housing, and I'm sure some of you are saying, well, what do you really mean by affordable housing? How do you define that? So the definition we've been using is that a reasonably and widely accepted standard is that housing is considered affordable for a renter household if its gross rent, which is rent plus utilities, does not exceed 30% of household income. Now it says renter in here, the same figure can be applied to owner-occupied housing as well. But let's focus on renters for now. So what this is saying is of your total income as a household, if you are paying more than 30% of that for your shelter needs, you are, that, that is deemed unaffordable to you. Now, when, uh, when affordable housing advocates talk about affordable housing, they're primarily focused on households with income significantly below what we would call the area media income. So again, let me clarify what that means. What is the area media income? Well, for, the, for Ottawa County, uh, for one person, the, the median income, so half, ex exactly dead middle between upper income and, and, and low income, is $47,900. For a family of four, that number's at $68,000. That is the dead middle, okay? What the, 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 the folks that we are primarily talking about when we're saying very low income come in at 50% of that figure. For one person, it's about $24,000. For a family of four, or a household of four, it's, it's about 34000 So that gives you a little context when we're talking about affordable housing for whom. That's kind of the figures we're looking at. So how many of these do we have in Ottawa County? How many would you deem very low income? Well, about 18,500 households, or 19% of the county. Okay, so again, just want to give you a little context as we shift back to this 30% figure that I'm talking about. So if you are paying greater than 30%, you are classified what is called shelter overburden. Okay, this is a federal, a federal standard, greater than 30% shelter overburden. And so I want to give you uh, some figures to show you what's been going on in our community around this, around this number. In the year 2000, 29% of our county was considered shelter overburden. By 2006, that number was at 42%. By 2012, that number was at 49.7%. About half of our renting community would be deemed shelter overburden. Well, what's the significance of that? So what, so what people are paying more than 30%? Well, what that means is that it's a dangerous threshold. If you're paying more than 30%, that means you're paying less for other basic necessities. Food, transportation, clothing, education, etc. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's deemed, based on studies, a dangerous threshold. So you can see this number is increasing every year. Now I do want to show you this for context. Again, we're going to talk mostly about renter households, but again, this figure can be used for owner-occupied as well, home ownership. In 2000, this number was at about 15%. By 2006, it was closer to 30%. By 2012, it started to level off at 27.3%. Okay? I think when you look at owner-occupied, it's swayed a little bit because once you get into higher middle income and upper income, you can afford to pay greater than 30%. You have that, you quite honestly, you have that luxury, that choice. So I think it sways a little bit, but still for context's sake, you can see how this is leveling up. So hopefully you can start to see some similarity in, in different numbers we're coming up with. Based on the United Way Community Needs Assessment, about half of the, the, the renter community is having difficulty making housing payments, and then from federal survey data, about half of, of renter households are considered overburdened. 
Okay, so we start to see the similarity in numbers. So why has housing become unaffordable? What is taking place here? Well, there's a number of factors. Uh, uh, and we don't have time to, to dive into absolutely every single one of them. But I do want to just highlight one of the greatest factors that, that, that is taking place. So from 2000 to 2012, we can look at median monthly mortgage increasing 19.5%. At the same time, median monthly rent went up 22.5%, okay, from 2000-2012. During that time, median income in this area increased 3.77%. So it's not hard to see that while housing has gone up, wages have largely stayed relatively flat. So there's less money to pay for housing in this area. Now, I'm going to make a statement that I know makes people uncomfortable. But I don't know why, because this is a part of our, our reality. That statement is, we have low-wage paying jobs in Ottawa County. We don't only have low-wage paying jobs. We have high paying jobs. We have middle paying jobs. But the reality is we have low paying. We have low-wage paying jobs, too. Before I go any further, I'm not making a political statement here. I'm not going to talk about wage rates. I want to make, I want to make a statement very clear. Low-wage jobs are critical to the success of our local businesses and therefore our overall economy. I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe that we couldn't do the good work in our businesses without these jobs. So I, I want to make that, that perfectly clear before, before I go on. So I, I had a sheet, and I don't have it, I forgot to bring it up here, but I don't know how many of you get Michigan Works job blasts every couple days. They let you know who's hiring, what positions they're hiring for, and for how much they're hiring. And I just got one Friday, and I thought it'd be so clever to print it out and highlight it and bring it up here, and then I forgot it. On the one that came out Friday, it said 80 new positions available Tuesday. And there were about five different companies that were hiring, and each one had 20 positions, 15 positions, 20 positions, and it broke down by machine operator, assembly, uh, cook line, uh, uh, call representative, etc. And every single one of those jobs posted was between $7.50 an hour and $13 an hour. Okay, so if you look at what that, if, if you look at what those figures are, that's what we would consider low wage. Again, I'm, I'm just making a reality statement that we have these jobs in the community. So I asked Michigan Works, hey, could you pull some numbers for me? How many of these jobs did you post in the last year? They said, sure. 3,165 of those job postings went out. I said, how many would you deem to be low wage? He said, well, we estimate 90% of those are between $7.50 and $14 an hour. We have these jobs. That's okay. If you look at what that would be annually, it's anywhere between 15,000 and 29,000. So again, going back to some of the area, very low area median income folks, th this is what we're talking about. So again, critical to the success of our economy. Here's one of the first key statements I want to make here this morning. This is, this is very important. I'll repeat it uh, probably throughout the rest of the hour. If we have low wage paying jobs, we as a community need housing that supports these jobs. If we want people to fill our businesses and to work in these positions, we need to have the housing that equates to that. Or where are they going to live? If we have the jobs, we need the housing. So let me, uh, let me break down, uh, going from, from macro to micro, what does this look like at the uh, actual rent, monthly rental level? And, and so we pulled some 2013 fair market rent amounts for the, for the county, uh, or for Holland Grand Haven. You can see that on this chart you have what, it, what the fair market rent is for one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom. And then below that, the wage that would be needed to afford those places in our community. So for one bedroom, we're talking $12.78 an hour. For a three bedroom, we're talking uh, $20.92. Just interesting fact, we have some of the highest three bedroom rates in, in the state. I don't know why that one is so, so swayed, but um, just interesting to know. So you can see what wage would be needed to afford some of the fair market rent in the community. Then if we look at some of the wages that I just talked about, the, a lot of the jobs that are available at this point, you can see at minimum wage, we're talking about uh, at that 30% figure, $384 a month would be deemed affordable. We have absolutely nothing close to that that isn't subsidized. In the that, 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 uh, that gentleman I talked about earlier, Jim, in, in the, the weekly rental room, living in a house with six to eight other guys, for, for one month to live there, he's paying $500, $125 a week. Okay? 
and, and this is what the fair, this is what would be deemed affordable at that wage. And you can also see at nine dollars and eleven dollars what would what would be available. Now this is a, another important statement, and I don't have the clear data to share this today, so I apologize. But not only are we struggling with the affordability piece, we just don't even have the supply. We don't have one bedrooms at 664 that are readily available in the community. So we, we're struggling both from affordability issue, but also the supply issue. So who's affected by the affordability issue? This is another one of my uh, pauses to challenge perceptions. Try to conjure up an image in your mind. I'm sure many of you came up with this image. This is a famous photo of a homeless gentleman. And rightfully so, I did start out with an example from a homeless shelter, so that's fair. But think about who's affected by this issue. How many of you thought of this gentleman? Or this lovely woman? Let me talk about each of these. The average college graduate coming out of school now has $26,000 average in student loan debt from federal loans. It has $1 trillion in our entire country as student loans. A, a recent survey revealed that you add up all the debt that kids come out of college with, so debt to families and friends that's promised to be repaid, private loans, credit card debt, we're looking at $35,000 as a more likely figure. But if we just focus on the $26,000, and I'm sure I know I can think of people who have two, maybe three times that much. I'm sure you can as well, but this is an average. When you break that out based on what current student loan rates are and the life of the loan, we're talking about $320 a month fresh out of college. That is an expense that you have immediately. I just shared uh, the, the fair market rent for uh, a minimum wage or what would be appropriate. It's pretty close to that number. And here's another shocking thing that we came across in, in researching for today. From the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 48% of college graduates are working in their first career outside of college in a job that is less than a college degree needed job. Now some of you in workforce development, economic development might be, what's, what's he really saying here? Well, if you come out with an engineering degree, technology degree, biosciences, you have a pretty good chance of getting a, a, a good job, a high paying job. Um, and, and so your degree is needed. But we still have a lot of people coming out of college with an economics degree, like myself, and there aren't a lot of jobs readily available to young <laughs> aspiring economists in the community. So that first job out of college is often not, need, you often do not need a college degree. So what that means is we have a lot of these young college grads that not only are strapped by student debt, but they're also not making as much money as they anticipate. They're struggling with this issue of affordability. Where are they going to live in the community? Now let's go down to this next picture, right? Seniors in our community. I'm sure you've heard this statistic a dozen times, but I'm going to say it again. Every single day, 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65, and they will for the next 19 years. We have a lot of baby boomers in this community. Where are they going to live? And I mentioned that this is a desirable retirement community. And not everybody that moves here to retire is going to a retirement uh, facility or living on the lake. In fact, the bulk of these folks are living on a fixed income, maybe Social Security, maybe a pension. Where are they going to live in our community? Or what about individuals with disabilities in our community? Physical, mental, autistic. Some of you may or may not have seen a recent article in the Grand Haven Tri Tribune about a woman named Jill Osterbahn. She's here today, has been serving on the planning committee. Jill has been looking for an affordable and accessible place to live. She is in a wheelchair for the last several years. There's nothing available to her. We have severe cuts taking place right now in the state for our community mental health department, which means not everyone that really needs mental health support, is getting the supportive housing they need, where are these people going to live? Not just today, but in the future. Autism. Over the next 15 years, 500,000 children diagnosed with autism will be entering into adulthood. Where will they live? Okay, so when we talk about this issue of affordability, it affects a lot of different populations of people. So as part of my 
clarifying and um, challenging perception.